The following is a presentation of Surprise Church. El siguiente programa es la presentación de la iglesia Surprise. We are in part two of a leadership series today, and uh, we just thought it would be really cool to start first by dismissing kids, since we haven't done that yet. So kids, go have a great time at Surprise Kids today. Listen to your teachers. Quiz your parents on the way home. Have a great time. Come for candy and Easter eggs next week. Palm branches. Cool. Awesome. All right. If you, if you even have a moment to stop by and thank our uh, amazing kids staff on your way out. You know, they're, they're just volunteers. I, I call them staff because I rely on them like staff. But they're just amazing people. And we're just grateful for that, that team. And so part of our table after church today is to just keep building that amazing team as our church continues to grow. Uh, so last week, if you were here, you heard us talking about how leadership is often misunderstood to be about position. So if you are the boss, you can lead. If you are the employee, you cannot. If you are the parent, you can lead. If you are the child, you cannot. If you are the pastor, you can lead. If you are the parishioner, you cannot. If you are the president, you can lead. Now, I don't want to hear any jokes now. And if you are a citizen, you can. You see what I'm saying here? There's a sense in our culture, there's a sense in just our human psyche, I think, that if you don't have the right position, you have to wait for the right position. And last week, we tore that apart and just threw it away because it's garbage. We talked about how Jonah had the position of leadership as a prophet. But he did the opposite of leadership. He, he disobeyed. He led in a poor way. Because leadership isn't about position. It's about, what did we say? The I word. It's about influence. Leadership is about influence. If you're taking notes, we have an insert in your bulletin to kind of track along with the message. And that's our first thing today. Building on last week, leadership is not about having authority over someone as much as it is having influence toward someone. And all of a sudden, if you embrace that idea of leadership, your life explodes with meaning and purpose because guess what? God has put you in a family, in a community, in a neighborhood, in an apartment building, in, in a home, in a school, in a workplace, in a retirement home, in whatever, wherever. God has put you in a place and you're surrounded by relationships and environments that need positive influence, that need biblical leadership. When you see leadership is about influence, your life explodes with purpose. Grab onto that one as we get started today. Because when we forget that, we, 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 we forget to look for those opportunities around us. Jonah didn't lead. The sailors who didn't even know God led Jonah to pray. And ultimately, by watching God work through Jonah's failure to lead, came to God themselves. And so we left off asking, what are the leadership voids in your life? And how can you make a plan not to be a Jonah, but to be a sailor? To not necessarily be in charge, not necessarily have it all worked out in your faith, not necessarily be the one with all the answers, but lead well with the environment God gives us. So building on that today, I want to talk about a little, a little boy in John 6 who had a dilemma. Jackson, you want to come up here for about 25 minutes? I got a visual aid helper today. I can tell, yeah, let's give Jackson a hand. Come on up the stairs, bro. Jackson's going to be preaching the message today, but he's not going to have to say a word. He's just going to be my standing, come on, right up front here, right up front. Isn't he a good-looking young man? What a good dude. Comes from good stock, I tell you. If you know his dad, Justin, you know where he gets his good looks, and his mom, Michelle, of course. And um, so, so, so Justin's kind of representing this, this boy in John 6. This boy in John 6 has very little other than a basket. If I had a basket, Jackson would be holding the basket. He goes to listen. There you go. Creative, imaginative. I love it. Gives you hope for the next generation, doesn't it? So this little boy in John 6 goes to hang out with thousands of other families, probably with his family, on a mountainside just to listen to Jesus. Maybe he came, he came there with the, maybe the same impulse you had when you came to church today. You're like, I just want to hear from God. Because maybe, just maybe there's something in there for me. And he brings lunch maybe for his family. He, he's, he's in charge of that. Maybe everybody else has heavier suitcases and whatnot. He's probably even smaller than Jackson. About, you know, five, six hours into the teaching, I mean, Jesus is just teaching and teaching and teaching. People don't even think about their needs. They don't think about, we've got to get out of here now so we can get to a, a distant city in time to have food or a place to sleep. They just are so drawn to him, they forget about their needs. 
and they just sit there and listen to him. And all of a sudden, Jesus' disciples are like, whoa, we got a problem here. They see the storm brewing. They see a mob of 5,000 men, which meant probably 15 to 20,000 adults and children put together. And they say, what are we going to do? Because it's going to get dark and they're going to have to walk miles and miles and miles in the dark on an empty stomach. They're going to pass out on the way. If we don't feed them, they could die. They could, they could you know, fall. They could falter. We got a problem, Jesus. These people have been following you too faithfully. They have been recklessly just leaving themselves up for, for risk just to be near you. What are we going to do? And, G- and Jesus kind of listens to them. This little boy must have heard about it. He must have been close enough to the kind of the buzzing skirmish of concern surrounding Jesus and his disciples because he shows up in the story. He must have ap- approached or thought about approaching. And so here he is holding his basket of five loaves of bread and two fish. And he's got this, this, this internal battle of, do I dare walk up to these famous local celebrities and say, can I help and give you this basket? I'll, I'll get laughed, if not scolded away. I'll get, I'll get mocked and teased for thinking I can make a difference, thinking I, a kid, can make a difference in this, with this small amount. This kid's dilemma in John 6 is, can I lead with what I have, or do I fail to lead, fail to step up because of a limitation of age and abundance? Leadership can be a void because you think, well, I don't have the right position. You can also not step forward to lead because you don't think you're old enough or you think you're too old. You can also fail to lead because you don't think you have enough resources or you think you have so much that you don't have time to part with your busy and important life and schedule. Age and abundance, too much or too little, can cause us to miss leadership opportunities. And this boy has that dilemma happening in his life right now. What we're going to do is we're going to go back to a story of another little boy that I think was on this little boy's mind when he stood there staring into his pathetic little basket. Real basket. You see, this boy was raised in the Hebrew culture, an oral culture that constantly told stories. And, and that many little boys rose, or were raised having to memorize huge swaths of what we now know of as the Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament, of course. They called it the Bible. And, and he would have gone over this particular story, the story of David, over and over and over again. I imagine that there were few stories that, that boys like Jackson and his age during Jesus' time loved to hear more than the story we're about to hear because they are more empowering than just about any other story. Samuel, the, the prophet, the judge in Israel, is about to choose a new king because the old king was a, a, a real disaster. Saul, an insecure train wreck, uh, failed in his living up to what his potential was. Saul was a head taller than everyone else. You could pick Saul out of a crowd, and yet at his coronation ceremony, they couldn't find him. They had this moment where they go, and now, Israel, meet your new king, Saul. And there were crickets. Oh, he didn't hear us. And now, meet your new king, Saul. You know where he was? He was hiding amidst the luggage, it says. He was terrified and insecure despite being everything on the outside he looked apart. Saul fails miserably as king because that insecurity drives him mad. So, that, so while Saul is still king, God sends Samuel to anoint, to pour oil on the head of the next king. Now, I actually have some oil. We're going to try this. Gu- I'm just kidding. So, uh, but that's what he would bring, a horn full of oil, and they would find the next king and they would anoint him. So if you were the king, you were the anointed one. The Greek term for anointed one is Christos, where we get Jesus Christ, the Jesus, the anointed one of God. So the roots are are, are right here in the Old Testament where God is anointing kings, Christing kings. Samuel shows up to Jesse's farm, ranch. I don't know what they they called it because they were sheep herders. If he had horses and cows, I'm sure it would be a ranch. No fences. They're just, just sheep. And Samuel is going to pick, listening to God, like a live uh, secret service uh, voice into his ear. All right, God, 
Is it this one? No. Next one. So he's listening to God speak supernaturally into his mind as he's looking for the next king. Now, watch what happens. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab. Eliab is one of the oldest sons of Jesse. Jesse has eight sons. He sees Eliab and he sees a guy that looked like Saul. Looked like my first college roommate who when you saw him, he had basketball-sized shoulders. He ate tuna for breakfast. Protein, protein, protein. He was a beefy guy. The kind of guy you'd expect to want to be in charge and be in charge and command respect. That's Eliab. Samuel, the prophet, sees Eliab and he's like, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. The, the Christ with a small C is in standing right here in front of me. Right, Lord? Right, Lord? But the Lord said to Samuel, I had to put it in yellow because it's so powerful. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God looks at something else than age and appearance. For the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Tell yourself that, that the next time you look into the mirror, will you? The next time you're trying on outfit after outfit or looking at the love handles or the complexion or the wrinkles or the hair, the Lord does not worry about your appearance. He's not concerned he certainly wants you healthy, but he doesn't need you. He doesn't need you to look a certain way to use you. He doesn't need you to be a certain size or age to use you. Samuel, the prophet, was learning that. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God's leadership priority is the leader's heart, not the leader's age or resources. God has a skill that most heart surgeons would really covet. He can look at your heart without having to cut you open. <laughs> I got to observe a surgery and there was a mistake made and they nicked an artery and they had to open up the whole chest and I'm staring in there. I'm like, I'm just going to back up away from the table because I don't want to do any more damage than already is happening. It was a massive procedure opening up a chest. God doesn't have to do that. He can just see the heart. He just he can kind of cut through all the facades that we put up and just know our heart condition. He, he knows what's happening inside of you so that when you pray, you're not telling him anything he hasn't heard because he sees it. He just wants you to name it and be honest about it for your own sake. He does not worry about your age or resources. He doesn't kind of come down from heaven and go, God, if that guy had another thousand bucks a week, I could, I could really do great things. You know, if he were just a little younger and fitter, man, alive, we could fit some great clothes on him and he would look great and then people would follow him like crazy. God is so unimpressed by those things, he oftentimes uses people who don't fit that bill in scripture just to remind us over and over and over again that it's about our heart condition and our heart orientation, not our age or abundance. So let's follow the story to its conclusion here. This is, this is good stuff. Jesse, dad, I mean, he wants, he wants to be represented well. Jesse wants his biggest, toughest son because if the king looks good, Jesse looks good because that's his son, right? He wants to be pictured in the paper with his big strapping son that's a king, right? So Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. So one by one, he's like, eh, eh, eh. They're guys, I assume they grunted, you know, I don't know. Eh, eh, all seven. And then there's no more left. Well, was this a mistake? Did he not bring, you know, all of his kids? What's going on? Samuel said to Jesse, are, are all your sons here? And he said, well, <laughs> there remains the youngest. But he's over there keeping the sheep. And he's the youngest. I mean, you, you can't use someone so young, right? You can't do someone, something with a teenager or, or a pre-teenager. You can't do something like that. You, don't, you honestly... You honestly don't want me to, to have them lead the flock, do you? And come over here? You do? Right now. Okay, I'll call him. So he goes and has one of his big, strong, strapping sons take the flock and bring his free teenager, or however old David was, probably very young. And I imagine, even though it says David was a, a good-looking young man, I imagine him as the most awkward teenager in the world because it just makes the story better. I imagine him with, as a voice-cracking, pimply-faced, 
I just grew six inches and I don't know what to do with my legs, teenager. So, uh, David, come on in. Okay, Dad. And I imagine him just stumbling in from the flock, unable to keep his voice in the right tone because it's just all over the place. He's popping zits on his way in and getting his face clean. Hey, yeah, Dad. That is not what you look like. You look awesome. But he was awkward. <laughs> We're making a contrast here. The youngest is keeping sheep. Hey, check this out. By age five, Mozart was performing keyboard and violin before royalty. By age 14, they were professionally performing his ballets. Louis Braille was a 15-year-old blind student in France who thought there must be a better way to educate and help blind people read than just making big letters for them to feel and touch. So he invented the Braille system at age 15. Bobby Fischer became the international world chess grandmaster, how about that for a title, when he was a teenager. John D. Rockefeller started a business, had a very, very profitable first year and became one of the most, if the, the most influential and successful businessmen in history. Steve Jobs started working with uh, Steve Wozniak as a teenager to develop the first personal computer, which blew up into Apple, of course. Mark Zuckerberg started commercializing Facebook as a teenager. Bill Gates founded Microsoft as a teenager. Mary had Jesus as a teenager. I think she wins the list so far. Jesus' disciples, probably teenagers. Second Great Awakening, led by Jonathan Edwards as a famous historical figure. I did my uh, college dissertation on this uh, research pro paper project, and you ask him what happened. How did the greatest revival in church history start? How did this huge movement of God happen along the east coast of the colonial United States? You know what he said? He said, young people started talking about God, and they kept talking and talking and sharing and encouraging and they, have, they, they just started the movement. It started among young people, the, the, one of the greatest revivals in world and human history. God uses youth. He doesn't look past it like we often do, like youth maybe even do, to, to say, well, uh, when you get older, good luck, man. We could really, you're gonna be something great someday. God uses youth. Uh, God works through youth. God builds through youth in and outside of the church and, and history is full of stories. One of my favorite books, by Joshua Harris, Do Hard Things. It's a book written to kids reminding them that adolescence doesn't have to continue into your 30s. Adolescence used to not exist. Did you know this? We invented adolescence in the last century. Come on. We invented it as a, a period of life where you're supposed to just play video games, board games, hang out, and then when you get, now every year that the millennial generation grows a year older, they're extending the definition of adolescence another year. Pretty soon, you'll be 40 and you'll still be on your parents' health insurance, you know? And I don't think it's all bad. I do think in a complex society, adolescence probably can be a helpful period on some levels, but not if it causes kids to fail to lead. Not if it causes parents and grown-ups to look down at the next generation and see them in the waiting room rather than on the front lines of God's mission in the world. Amen? God tells us not to to look down upon youth, to not look at a old age and say, ah, God can't do that. But rather to say, what can God do? He tells us not to look at a resource and say, eh, not enough. But to say, more than enough for God. First Samuel 16 continues. David now, sent, he's the king now. Not king yet, but he's the future king who's been anointed. He's still got the oil, the scent of the oil through his face. I was going to say through his beard, but he didn't have a beard yet. It was still keeping his hair kind of greasy and the good kind of greasy. He maybe still just had that smell of, you're the king. The voice of Samuel saying, you're the king. But for now, he's just a kid and his dad told him to bring bread and cheese to his big brothers fighting in the army. So here's the king carrying bread and cheese to his, his brother's who are on the front lines in an entrenched battle against the Philistines. Now, if you know anything about this story, the Philistines had a champion named Goliath. Goliath is a bully. He's a nine and a half foot bully, so he's the worst kind of bully. And there have been people above eight feet and above nine feet in history, so we, we don't think this is an exaggeration by any means. We think this is legit. It talked about the weight of his spear and sword that most of us couldn't even lift it. Even those of us who lift couldn't lift it. He was a, a man's man. He was a fearful figure. 
and his challenge for 39 days, Goliath comes out in front of the Philistine army and plants both feet on the mountainside and shouts across the valley to the Israelite army and says, send one man to me. And we're going to go mano y mano. If I win, you're our slaves. If he wins, we'll be your slave. Let's just get this done man to man. First of all, I'm like, that's a terrible idea. If you're Israel, you're like, how about we just all fight each other? And hopefully you just get, you know, pushed to the side in the crowd or something. But who, who would want the battle decided that way? The most lopsided relationship in, in the world. A giant versus a normal human being. So for 39 days, Goliath stands and taunts God's chosen people, Israel, across the valley. He mocks them, he mocks their God, and they do nothing. They stand there shaking in their boots. Not one person steps up to lead. Fear grips them. And Goliath is making them more and more every day sink deeper and deeper into despair. The thing is, Goliath should have stopped on day 39 because David shows up on day 40 and David's not afraid. See, David had just been told that his age and his inexperience and his lack of resources had nothing to do with his future kingship. And he had also watched God use him to defeat wild animals caring for the sheep. He, he just wasn't afraid. And Goliath should have quit on day 39 because on day 40, the number of completion, David shows up with his bread and cheese and he hears Goliath mocking God's people. David stood, said to the man who stood by him, what should be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Did you notice that David didn't say a thing about, wow, he's big. David didn't say a thing about, look how big his spear is. He didn't say a thing about, hey, that's unfair because he's really big and we're really small. He looks past the conflict towards the victory party. Have you ever done, have you ever done that when you're playing sports? Students, or if you're on the free throw line, you envision the swish before you shoot the free throw. That's something that they, they've proven can actually improve your shooting percentage. Envisioning God coming through before God comes through is one way of developing faith in a God who comes through. See him do it. Look at life after he does it. Trust that it's going to happen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, Hebrews says. David said to the man, what's going to happen to the guy who kills this guy? What's he going to get? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the living God? Look at David's leadership. David refuses to worship age and abundance. He refuses to let the scenario in his perception and in his experience simply sit on the chair of age and abundance. It's just a math equation. He's bigger. He's stronger. He's got more. David says, I'm, I'm not going to limit myself and my people to this. And instead, he envisions a victory party after the defeat of someone that he knows is trying to do something that God has promised won't happen and destroying his chosen people at that time in history. And so, in the end, he just declares God's power. He declares the reason behind his courage, and that's not his power. Good grief, he's a stumbling preteen. It's God's power. He was thinking beyond what people see to a God who has no limit in his capacity. When the Philistine looked at and saw David, so David, fast forward, David volunteers to fight him. And they try putting armor on David, but he's too small. The armor weighs him down. He can't even move. So he picks up five stones and a sling. <laughs> he comes at the giant with a slingshot. And not one of those nice ones you can use. Like, this is like an ancient version of a slingshot. It's like a bandana. You just twirl around and, and you throw a rock. On every level, David looks pathetic from a human perspective. Sure would, that's sure what Goliath thinks. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. Why? For he was only a youth. Samuel, the prophet, disdained him because he was a youth. Jesse, his dad, didn't even have him come because he was too young. Goliath now sees him and mocks him because he is too young. Over and over and over again, he hears too young, but he's listening to the voice that says, you're the next king. I, look how many times he talks about I and me here. Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. 
The Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the field. Let's compare, or in a minute we're going to compare that, that leadership to David's leadership and see them side by side and see how different they are. So look at David's. But David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This very day, the Lord will de deliver you into my hand and I will strike you down and cut off your head. How about that trash talk? <laughs> and I will give your dead bodies to the, the body to the Philistine army this very day to the birds of the air and to the wild animals of the earth so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not save by sword or spear abundance, resources, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. Compare the leadership here. Goliath's leadership, insecure leadership. Have you, have you ever had an insecure leader? It sucks, doesn't it? They're, it's awful. They are so concerned about themselves. They are so concerned about proving themselves that they're willing to use you, aren't they? It's awful. Goliath is nine and a half feet tall and he still feels the need to prove himself. I mean, if I'm nine and a half feet tall, I got my feet up and I'm saying, you know what, I'm, I'm good. He's not good. Because all his confidence is in himself. His hope is in his size. And he needs to prove that over and over and over and over. For, for, for Goliath, his leadership model is, model is I'm the man and it's about me. David's leadership is I'm the messenger. I came here just holding bread and cheese and I'm, I'm just here for God and it's about him. That's the roots of David's courage. Goliath rejects David's age and lack of resources. The first thing he did is mock him because of his youth. David rejects human perspective. He wouldn't even consider that as a limiting factor for what God can do. Goliath mocks David's age. David honors God's leadership. It's just not about age to him. Goliath declares a threatening future based on, based on personal victory. Me, 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 me. I will be you. Insecure people need people around them to be pressed down. They need people around them to be diminished so that they can feel better about themselves. Can't, isn't that the way it goes? And when we're insecure, that's how we operate. When I'm insecure, that's how I operate. I need everybody else around me to look less intelligent, less whatever than me, to make me feel better when I'm thinking like a liar. David just declares God's victory. This is not about David. David does what you and I need to do in order to truly be free in Jesus. We need to get out of the way and just let it not be about us anymore. We need to just stop worrying about, can I prove myself? And every single thing we do becomes an avenue of proving yourself rather than an avenue of following him. It becomes a way of trying to demonstrate that you're good enough rather than affirming that God made you good enough in Jesus and just living for him in freedom. Freedom in Christ means not having to be a bully. It means not having to be insecure every day with your reputation and identity on the line. Goliath was the most enslaved person in that battlefield. David was free. He'd been told by God who he was. And Goliath would die that way. Back in John 6. I knew we'd get back to this, didn't we? This boy stands with a basket. Five loaves of bread. What can you do with five loaves of bread? What can you do with five stones and a sling? What can you do with a, as a kid, as a preteen? Then he remembered a story of a, of, a, of a kid who didn't even get included when they looked for a king, but God handpicked him because of his heart. And he, and he thought, you know what? If God can use David, maybe, 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 maybe he can use me. If God can use David, maybe he can use me, a senior citizen. Maybe he can use me, a 15-year-old, a 20-year-old. A maybe he can use me, a 12-year-old. So stumbling, a little nervous, he, probably, he walked up to the disciples as they're debating. I just imagine their hands. Oh, we can't do that. If we send them now, we'll have to cut Jesus off. But if we send them now, they probably won't get in town in time to get food. They'll faint on the way. What are we going to do? Excuse me, sir. I imagine Tiny Tim. Yeah, I have some more. Except he's giving them a basket. Would this help? Now, in the disciples' response, we even see the two different ways of thinking, human versus divine. 
Uh, when Jesus says, what are we going to do? How are we going to get him some food? Kind of testing his disciples. Philip demonstrates the human perspective. Philip answered him, it would take more than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread to have everyone have a bite. And we don't have that money, Jesus. We don't have the abundance we need to lead in that way. But Andrew was there too. Now, Andrew was kind of a little brother of Peter. Peter, this brash, I'll say whatever's on my mind. People will follow me because I speak loudly. I have demands. I make them known. Peter. Andrew was always kind of in Peter's shadow. Getting tired? Yeah, we'll, we'll be done soon. Peter's always in, uh, Andrew's always in Peter's shadow, and so Andrew noticed this kid when he comes up with his basket. And, and he took the time to walk over and, 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 and look in his basket and, and take it. Take him over to Jesus. Another disciple, Andrew, spoke up. Here is a boy. Here, right here. Jesus, right here. Here's a boy with, with five small barley loaves and two small fish. I'm not sure what you can do with it, but here. Jesus, I imagine him a big old smile. That's enough. Thanks, kid. Takes the basket, blesses it. He says, hand it out. 5,000 families eat. And if they collect the leftovers, they have 12 baskets full. <laughs> Something happened. When a young boy named David, when a young unnamed boy on the mountainside in John 6, decide that it's worth offering what you have to God, even from a human perspective, when you're too young to, to offer it or too old to offer it or you don't have enough to offer, when he just decides to offer to God what he has and just see what God can do, God multiplies it beyond their wildest dreams and they have more left over than when they started with. It's a story that isn't meant to die on that mountainside. It's meant to, to live today. It's meant to, for us to grab a hold of it and wonder, what are those voids in our lives? Surprise, church. And you, By the way, I'm going to give this guy's back a break. Will you thank Jackson for helping me out? Have a seat, brother. You can have a seat this way. I want to talk about how that fleshes out in conclusion as a church. Surprise, church. We'll, we'll, we try to lead. We try to influence by trusting God to do great things, whatever our age or abundance. As you can see around you, we rent space in a gym, okay? We set everything up. We got here at 2 o'clock yesterday, set up, band practice. We get here early in the morning. Everything that happens, we set it up from scratch and take it down, and we're gone like no one was here. We don't have a, a, a huge auditorium, built-in uh, effects and media. We don't have set-up environment. We don't have a lot of the resources that a big established church has, but we trust when Jesus says that doesn't matter. We really trust that. We really do. We believe that he can do more with our faith than with our things. And when people come to me and say, I'm not sure this church is for me, because I know you're trying to reach young people in this church, and I'm not sure it's for me because I'm older. I'm like, we want older people with a passion for the next generation. And so we've got a community of middle-aged and, and senior citizens who are passionate about the thing we're passionate and that's raising up the next generation, not looking past the Davids and the little boys in John 6 and, and forgetting that they can change the world. In fact, that they should be right now rather than in the future. So Surprise aims to be different than what we're seeing around us in most churches that are getting older and smaller and older and smaller and older and smaller because they've forgotten that our primary responsibility during this hand breath of life we have on earth is to pass the torch to the next David who will pass the torch to the next David to the next David and make sure that we are challenging ourselves to hand leadership, to hand influence over to, to the youngest and the oldest. To not be limited by age, to not be limited by abundance. So stop by the kids' table on your way out. Seriously, try it. Raise up the next David for us. Help with our, our, one of our middle school, high school groups. Just have your eyes open on Sundays. Look for people that are maybe probably going to be told everywhere else that they're too young or too old but not here because this is a community that doesn't worry about age or abundance. We worry about what God tells us we are and what God tells us to do and we're not going to be limited by anything. Something else. amazing. Our cause. What if kids, like the kids in that prison school, hear over and over vo no voice at all or only negative voices that just don't believe in them? What if, what if senior citizens are expected to go the next 5, 10, or 15 years or more of their life expecting that their best days are behind them rather than in front of them in Jesus? What if we're a church that believes that God is bigger than that, that age and abundance don't limit him or us, and that we look for every opportunity we can to declare a future victory party that God wins by working through the unlikely, even us. Let's pray. God, 
Let's stand and pray. God, we offer ourselves to you as an instrument, whether we have much or whether we have little, whether we're young or whether we're old, and we ask that you would reach us to be the voice that anoints the next generation, that anoints people who feel lost without purpose or without hope because they're doing human math rather than grabbing hold of the infinite equation that happens when Jesus stands on the mountainside with a basket of bread. We love you, in Jesus' name. Let's sing.